Vertex Technology Acquisition Corporation, VTech in short, and also 17 Life, as they explain the proposed business combination of BC in short. VTech is the first SPEC special purpose acquisition company listed in Singapore, and they've announced a proposed business combination with live streaming platform 17 Life Inc. 17 Life operates in Japan and Taiwan, and they've also got a presence in Hong Kong, Singapore, the US, India, Philippines, and Malaysia. And according to Foss and Sullivan, 17 Life commanded a market share by revenue of about 20.8% in Japan and 26.9 Japan and 26.9% in Taiwan, and is also a top pure play live streaming platform by revenue in Japan and Taiwan. Now joining us today, we've got several speakers with us. From VTech Spec itself is Mr. Jiang Honghui, Executive Director and CEO of VTech, who will take us through the proposed transaction. From 17 Live Management Team, we've got Mr. Joseph Kua, Chairman and Co-Founder of 17 Live, who will give us an overview and introduction to the company. Mr. Alex Lian, we've also joined us, Group CEO, who will touch on the business overview. And then Mr. Jing Shen Eng, Co-Founder and also Group CTO, will explain more about the industry drivers and what's a V-Liver. And then lastly, Mr. Kenta Masuda, CFO, will also walk us through the financials. We'll spend the first half an hour with a presentation from 17 Live and also VTech, and then we'll proceed into Q&A later on. So Q&A for today is live. We're using the pigeonhole link. Um, do use that. Submit your questions. The link is available in the comment section. Please do continue to submit the questions throughout the session, and we'll try to cover all the questions along the way. Now, please keep your questions coming through also. And just a gentle reminder, this webinar is meant to be educational in nature, not meant to provide any recommendation for any investment product. Investors should also refer to the circular that's published by the company and also fully understand product features and risks before making investment decisions. Joseph, over to you, please. Hi, everybody. Um, before I start, let's watch a short video about 17 Life. What connects the world? It is the heartbeat of human connection. It is the symphony of irreversible moments. That's the power of live streaming technology. 1.7 Live is the number one live streaming platform in Japan and Taiwan. Connecting users and streamers from all over the world. We have built a vibrant live entertainment ecosystem of users and streamers, providing them an engaging and interactive experience. Users can send instant messages to interact with streamers and give virtual gifts to show their appreciation. Our interactive games improve engagement between the streamers and their fans. Our events go from online to offline with our in-house superior event coordination capabilities. Offline events provide experience for users to meet up with streamers in person to strengthen the bond among the community. We have invested in our proprietary technology, SkyEye, which combines advanced automated content monitoring technology and a dedicated multilingual monitoring team to ensure that our platform is safe and user-friendly for all. Beyond human live streaming, we have multiple business initiatives to create further engagement with our ecosystem, including virtual livers, games, and live commerce. Our vLiver technology enables real life and virtual streamers to coexist in the same space. Live 2D enables streamers to easily stream via an avatar with their smartphone. We have also launched our proprietary vLiver IPs to further penetrate our user base. We intend to further enhance and grow our live commerce services that we believe are synergistic to our core business. 1.7 Live envisions a world without boundaries, a world with connections powered through live technology. Redefining the future of live streaming, right here, right now. We empower human connection. Great. Can we get the slide back? 
Thank you all for taking the time to be with us here today. My name is Joseph. I'm the co-founder and chairman of 17 Life. Right? Along with me here today is our CEO, Alex, JS, our CTO and my co-founder, and Kenny, our CFO. 17 Life was first founded to ensure fair monetization for content creators. I remember the age of CDs and albums, musicians and artists to get a cent or two for off every dollar spent by the consumer. So very little, actually. The need for 17 Life was then born to ensure that all content creators are fairly compensated for live content that they create. Today, 17 Life is a platform that enables and empowers, celebrates high quality streamers with diversified unique streamer content. We are a leader in the established live streaming markets of Japan and Taiwan, as mentioned earlier, with expansion plans in Southeast Asia and nationally. A platform that provides unique live user experience and interactivity via online and offline communities. Now, this platform is built of tech-enabled growth engines, including the virtual live and our live commerce initiatives that Alex and Jess will talk you through later. Now, we've been EBITDA positive for many years now. It's a business model that's been proven uh, with our ability to monetize a very high quality user base. Now, we will be the first pure play live streaming platform to be publicly listed on the SGX. Now, with that, I'd like to hand over the time to our CEO who will tell you more about our business. Alex, please. Oh, thank you, Joe. Uh, good evening. My name's Alex. Um, uh, next slide, please. Oh, thank you. So as you see um, on the video, right, 17 Live is the number one live streaming platform, both in Japan and Taiwan. Um, you know, like what the video mentioned, we are all about empower human connection, and we take this very seriously. So the key to live streaming is about real-time interaction and the connection between the user and the streamer. You can see on the left, this is our top streamer from Naoki from Japan. He has been streaming on our platform since 2017. Um, every day for a few hours. He has been doing this since 2017, which is very impressed. And Angel from Taiwan, uh, she started as a celebrity pop star, and now she do this pretty much full time um, to uh, live streaming, engage with her fans on our platform. We provide all of our streamer with in-house talent management, and we create exciting online to offline event to help streamer monetize and engage with their fans. This really comes from our live interactive ecosystem. Our ecosystem create emotional connection and real-time interaction. And this also help us to create a very strong community. Uh, please, can you go to the next page? So we offer uh, diversified quality content. This means we have something for everyone. This comes from our 87,000 contractor streamer globally. You can see we have music, dancing, art, gaming, and V-Liver. So one of my favorite uh, streamer, uh, he's from Japan, and uh, he's a music, uh, he, he's a mu musician, and uh, his name is a Suzuki. Um, I would like to play a video, just kind of give you a little bit vibe about Suzuki. <laughs> He's uh, one of the top music streamer with a 400,000 follower on our platform. He swings every day. Uh, he started every day very early, 6 a.m. in the morning. So he's singing and entertaining his fans and while his fans are uh, commuting to work. So, um, and every song that he sings, he performs, is all original. He created himself. And we also help him create vir virtual effect. This help helping to uh, engage with his fan. And also, I think by doing this, he can continue to uh, support him as a musician to uh, chase after his dream and his career. And um, just last year, because um, you know he was doing really well on the live streaming side, he has uh, um, enough uh, funding to create his first debut album, and he has launched that. So we're very proud of Suzuki. So um, I think... People watch live streaming is where they want to find something where they belong as a community. And for me, uh, I watch live streaming every day. It's very relaxed and soothing for me. I think for our platform, everybody can find anything that they wanted. And uh, the, the content is um, has so much diversified um, different things for everyone to pick up um, and, and enjoy it. So on top of that, to help our streamer, we also partner with uh, different partnerships such as Capcom, 
uh, Hello Kitty. And also we do a professional basketball league, uh, league in Taiwan. And also had the privilege uh, to work with uh, former NBA player Jimmy, Jimmy Lin. He also, uh, you know, came on our platform and do live streaming. And, uh, you know, we, we really enjoyed it. And uh, I think the fans also enjoyed it. Uh, can you go to the next page? Thank you. So uh, let me uh, just give you a little bit uh, um, um, taste about what's online offline event, right? So currently 550,000 quality MAU globally, right? And average, our users spend 93 minutes per day to watch live streaming. The reason for this high view duration comes from our quality content. Also big part of it is our online to offline experience. So um, I would like to uh, uh, show the little video so you can actually see what is online offline events all about. So um, this is the uh, Sengoku event. Uh, we run this event every year as one of our signature events. So we're the streamer competing uh, from different uh, city um you know in, in japan and they all try to compete uh the number one title in japan so uh, they have to uh, uh uh do the cosplay to dress to fit uh the the, the thing of the event so um our, our streamer takes very serious uh, about you know uh, putting the makeup you know uh, get get the right outfit for this event and um and we host this uh event in the big function hall in the in 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 the uh, luxury hotel and um, basically, all the uh, streamer was streaming at the same time, and they were they were compete to different stages, and get supported by their fans. So, and also this is a real chance for their fans to see the streamer in person. So, um, this helps them to have a better engagement, and also um, you know uh, support them to chase after their dream. And we're also going to have a very exciting uh, uh, offline event coming out in Singapore uh, next week. So I'm very looking forward to it. So uh, with a 70 online event monthly and two offline event quarterly, it creates a lot of excitement and strong competition to help our streamer to, to pursue their dream. And offline experience also is very rare compared to our competitor. No one offered that. So this is very special for 17 Life. Next, please. So um, like, like I said at the beginning, we are um, all about building a strong community. And this really comes from the real-time interaction between our streamer and our user. And as you can see on the deck, right, from our unique interactive ecosystem with 87,000 diversified contract streamer that's supported by 550,000 quality MAU, this makes us the market leader in Japan, Taiwan. And this is the foundation for our core business. So with our VLiver growth strategy and our interactive game, along with uh, uh, initiative over on the live conference, I think this creates a unique opportunity for 17 Life. Um, now I'd like to uh, uh, hand it to JS so he will dive a little bit more on the monetization and our future growth strategy. Thank you. Thanks, Alex. I guess I'm JS, so I'm the CTO and co founder here at 17 Life. So I'll start with the basics a brief overview of our business model. So, so from the left to the right, uh, I'm going to go from left to right. So, users uh, buy virtual points from us from our platform and then they can spend these virtual points to buy uh, virtual gifts uh, to support their favorite streamers or to buy virtual items in our in-stream games to have a better gaming experience. Then we share a portion of this revenue we receive from the sale of virtual points uh, to our streamers. So it's a, quite a simple uh, business model. Next slide, please. Now, um, our primary growth driver uh, moving forward is called the VLiver. But before I talk more, let me show you what a VLiver is. Yeah. Right. So this is an example of a VLiver. Um, this is actually a streamer who is using a digital avatar, not showing their real face, um, to stream instead uh, of showing their real face, right? So VLivers in uh are a massive opportunity for to give you guys a good sense in Japan alone, um the Kager for VLiver is more than 40% and projected to grow by about uh, six times from a one billion dollar industry to a close to four billion dollar industry by 2027. 
now uh, on our own platform. So we've built technology to allow anyone to stream as a VLiber. So, and that has led to a 6.5x year on year increase in the number of organic VLibers we had. So in addition to that, we create professional uh, VLibers that's backed by a professional content curation team and also voiced by professional voice actors, right? And VLibers as a whole add a whole new, completely new dimension of user experiences uh, on our platform. So I give you an example of uh, offline event where we have both real life, real livers and uh, virtual livers. So this is one of our real events. You can see a, a real audience, a real band. And behind is one of our top V livers called Amura Yuki, greeting the audience. And then when uh, Suzuki san comes to start sing, she dances together with the song and the audience. Yeah. All right, so if you like the song, you can buy his album on 17 Live. Uh, next, please. So we are, uh, today we are already the market leaders in Japan and Taiwan, but there's a lot more room to grow. So uh, to give case in point, live streaming um, has a projected growth of more than 20% Kager uh, in, in Japan. VLiver has a projected growth of more than 40%, as mentioned earlier, in Japan. And live commerce has a projected growth of more than 40% in Japan. And together, uh, this uh, high growth large market is projected to grow uh, to about an $18 billion industry by 2027. Next slide, please. Now, beyond growing in Japan and Taiwan, uh, where we're market leaders, we also think that there are quite a lot of opportunities for market geographical expansion. Um, the reason, a big reason why we're launching uh, our listing in Singapore is because we see it as a great launch pad for Southeast Asia, where we see the live streaming industry grow by a cake of about 20% uh, year on year. And beyond Asia, just beyond Asia, we see quite interesting global opportunities uh, for VLivers in the US as well. So with that, I'll pass uh, the mic on to Kenny, uh, who will we'll go through the financials with you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Jess. Hi, everyone. I'm Kenny, Group CFO of One Second Live. So firstly, our platform has a large base with 550,000 MAU. This is amplified by 87,000 contracted streamers, creating a diverse and dynamic content ec ecosystem. More importantly, our user engagement is incredibly strong. Our DAU spend an average of 93 minutes daily viewing content. Remarkably, 16.1% of our MAU are spenders, demonstrating their deep commitment and our platform's robust monetization capability. Our business model is robust and proven. Last year, we generated more than 360 million in revenue with an EBITDA of more than 15 million. This financial health is a clear indicator of our sustainable growth and profitability. Next, please. So we have strategically recalibrated our business to prioritize quality user growth. This shift has resulted in a sustainable increase in the percentage of quality MAU, showing a new stage in user-based development. Our monetization strategy has been a success. While maintaining high ARPPU, we have seen a significant uptrend in our spend rate. This indicates not only sustained revenue, but also growing user engagement in your platform. 
Lastly, our business model is not just cash generative, but also increasingly profitable. We have maintained a strong EBITDA with our recent EBITDA margin reaching an all-time high due to our strategy shift to boost profitability. This demonstrates our effective operational efficiency and sharp financial condition. Then I would like to give it over to Jack from BTAC. Thanks, Kenny, and thanks, uh, Alex, Joseph, JS, for the introduction. So, hi, everybody. Good evening. So, let me just walk you all through uh, quickly on the transaction overview and also to explain a bit on the timeline and action items next, right? So, for those that have read uh, the circular uh, online, I believe some of you may have already received the envelope that has the gatefolds included to the shareholders. If not, you will be receiving it later this uh, week. So you have all these numbers in there. So let me just elaborate a little bit more. So first of all, uh, we're talking about purchase consideration. So these essentially are the shares that VTech is issuing to acquire 100% of 17 Life Inc., which is the holding company that holds all the businesses. So in inside the purchase consideration, there's two parts. Consideration shares are essentially those that will be issued at the completion. Currently, is targeting on the 8th of uh, uh, December. And these will be issued to the shareholders of 17 Life. And on top of that, there's an unknown shares. So what unknown shares means is that when the company achieves certain kind of financial target, over here, nearly two tranches, one tied to the whole audited FY23 full year financial results, another set tied to first half of 24 financial results. So if both of these uh, is uh, target is achieved, then you will get a full unout shares of one to two worth about one to two million. So this value is uh, calculated based on the dollar value of five dollars in per share. All right. So this is the consider purchase consideration up to nine to two point nine million. And if the bottom box basically illustrates what is the equity value of the company post completion. So it will consist of purchase consideration plus. VTAC, basically the cash that we hold to pass on to the company. So here, it depends on what is the redemption, the escrow amount. If the redemption is, there's no redemption, we will pass 100% of our, uh, you know, uh, the escrow amount, 208 to the company. If there's maximum redemption, we'll pass 60. And why you see 60 here? Because two of the shareholders of VTAC, namely the sponsor, the Vertex Holding, as well as Venezio, which is 100% owned by Tomasic. So these two vehicles, 30, 30 million each, is not redeeming. So minimum, there will be 60 million that go to the company, right? And pipe financing currently we're in the process of closing up to 10 million. The result will be announced next Tuesday, 21st of November. And last but not least, uh, the special bonus scheme. So for those that have read about it, essentially this is additional free shares that company will be giving out to uh, the non-redeeming VTAC shareholders, currently VTAC shareholders non-redeeming, plus also to those pipe investors. For every one share, you get 0 0.1 uh, share. So essentially 10% free shares. So with all these add together, the equity value of the company expected to be somewhere between 996 to 1159 post completion. So this is just illustrative numbers. Next, next slide. So just now I talked about the special bonus. In fact, this is part of the three schemes that we have introduced uh, to this deal to align the different stakeholders. So the stakeholder here refers to one, the current shareholders of VTech, including also the pipe investors. And second, the key executives in 17 Live team that's responsible for drive the future performance of the company. And third is the current shareholders of 17 Live. So these three groups are given, each is given an incentive scheme to align everybody together. So just now I mentioned about the first one, which is special bonus scheme. The second one, the executive incentive scheme, this is like something like, uh, you know, uh, option or ESOPs and all that that's given, it's called uh, it's EIS shares, that's given to the key executive of a company up to 2.55 million shares. And this is meant to, you know, uh, reward the performance if the company will achieve certain financial targets in FY23, FY24, and FY25. And last part, the, the, the part three is actually announced just now I mentioned earlier. So essentially, this is for the shareholder of the existing 1.7 Live existing shareholders is for them to get announced if company will achieve certain financial targets in F1 23 and first half F1 24. 
One thing to mention, which is very special about this uh, particular transaction, for the first incentive scheme, special bonus scheme, as well as the second one, the executive incentive scheme, these shares, although it is issued by VTAC to these two parties, but it actually come from the sponsor, Vertex Holding. Why? Because for every one share of special bonus and every one share of executive incentive scheme shares that's going to be give out, sponsor is going to waive the promote shares that it has. All right. So sponsor is going to waive this promote shares in order for these shares to be issued so that it doesn't cause dilutions to other shareholders. So this is a special scheme that we created to align the interests of all parties, which is very unique for this particular uh, transaction that you see here. Next page. All right, so a bit on the timeline and the key dates. So over here, you can see there's many multiple line items. I'm just going to cover two to three key dates here so you can remember. So first key day you can remember is 28th of November. All right, 28th November is the date that the redemption form, which you will be able to receive either by now or sometime this week, the redemption form must be received by our corporate secretary in mail, in post. So the only way to get redemption registered is to post it as soon as you can before 28th of November. It must reach our corporate secretary. All right. So align with that because uh, you know redemption is going to be uh, collected on 28th and to ensure orderly trading because the moment you the redemption shares in, the share cannot be traded. So we will be calling for a trading suspension starting from the morning of 28th November. And if you would like to receive the special bonus shares I mentioned earlier, as well as those so-called the additional warrants. So this was part of the VTAC IPO. For every one share that's non-redeeming, you will get additional 0.2 warrants. So for the additional warrants and the special bonus shares, to enjoy that, you must be a shareholder by record on 27th of November 2023. All right, so one day before the redemption form. If you don't want to redeem, you don't have to take any action. The next important date to remember is 1st December. So that is the EGM day. Essentially, you know, everybody gathers and then vote for the resolutions that's in the circular. So it'll be held at 2 p.m. at Raffles City Convention Center, 4th floor. And then the redemption result will also be announced during the EGM itself. Okay, and then currently, according to the current plan, unless some kind of extreme circumstances would happen, the trading will resume on the 4th December morning. All right, then assuming all parties, or rather this whole deal is approved, means all the resolutions that's approved on the EGM day, the completion is currently planned to happen on 8th December Friday. So what's going to happen on the completion day? So of course, you know, it will be traded as the company stock will become the name, will become 17 Life. And then for those that have so-called submitted the redemption request, you will receive the redemption payment on the completion date. And then uh, all the other, for those that didn't uh, send in the redemption form, they stay on shareholder, including the pipe investors, you will be receiving additional bonus shares also on the 8th December, all right, along with other things. Okay, so with that, uh, uh, let me go to the last page. Yeah, so this is essentially to explain a little bit of logic how this goes because some people may have asked, you know, so what if I, you know, uh, submit in the redemption form? Can I still vote at EGM uh, and so on and so forth? So the short answer is that redemption and voting is two separate matters. All right, so you can submit in or don't submit in the redemption you are welcome to come to the EGM and cast your vote. And for those that's holding through uh, SRS, then you have to you know, vote through your SRS operator. You either get a proxy from them or you give them the instruction. All right. So the key day is the 1st December. You have to come to the EGM to cast a vote. If you don't want to come and you want to send somebody a proxy, the proxy form must reach our corporate secretary by 29th of November. Okay, so now there's two outcome. What if the uh, so-called the, uh, the completion is uh, uh, despect? This completion is approved by the shareholders at the EGM. If it happens, then for those that also voted for 
redemption means submit in a redemption form, you will get your redemption payment on the completion date, which is the 8th of December. And then the redemption price currently, we have to be it has to be calculated two days before the completion, but as an indicative range based on our current estimate, which also we publicize in the circular, it's going to be somewhere between five dollar and five dollar and two cents. It will be somewhere in between, depend on the interest that escrow account is going to accumulate in the next couple of weeks and also. So this is the for those cases that for the case where the EGM approve this transaction means the business combination is successful. And for cases, in case if things doesn't go well, if the you know the business combination was not approved by the shareholder, then the next thing is going to do is the company have to proceed for liquidation. So currently, liquidation process is rather complicated process, and we have no uh, currently visibility on what the time is going to take. But it's going to be, you know, we're going to follow basically the procedure for doing that. So, by the way, if the EGM uh, so-called voted against a the deal, there will be no redemption as per what we have said. It will go through the liquidation process, which is a separate process by itself. Means you will not receive the redemption payment on the 8th of uh, December. It, that payment is only true if the EGM uh, so-called passed uh, this deal. All right. So I hope I explained this process clear. And uh, also the gateful as well as the gate circular that you receive will explain this in further details in text. We're happy to answer questions later on as well. So with that, I think we have come to the end of the presentation. And then, uh, you know, I think it's time for Q&A. Thanks, Hong Hui. Thanks, One Seven Live team. Okay, just looking at pigeonhole now, uh, just to recap, uh, do submit your questions via pigeonhole and we'll try to address them all tonight. Okay, but now starting out the first question, I think it's talking about the competitive landscape, right? Who are One Seven Live's current competitors, um, and what's your competitive edge uh, compared to these guys? Uh, and does One Seven Live have modes preventing competitors from taking away its customers? No, I can I can answer that. So there's a pure live streaming platform. Yeah, we we do have a competitor in both in Japan and Taiwan. Um, but what makes us uh, uh, special and different is that um, majority, they don't run any uh, uh, offline event. So once some live creates a, a very unique offline event and that um, ring sure that the streamer has a better way to uh, monetize and make a living, uh, you know, a good living on our platform. So I think that's one of the competitor edge compared to other um, other, other, other players. Second, uh, I mentioned the in-house talent management. Uh, mostly they work with agency, but we, we as a 17 Live, we have a, a full staff that helps our streamer on a daily basis, given the support they needed. And on top of that, we have 24-7 uh, um, customer service supporting so that normally um, the user, whatever the issue they have, uh, the uh, technical issue or any concern they, they have, they have the right channel to uh, to go to and also get the support they need it. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, 87,000 uh, contract streamer with us, and we usually uh, start renegotiating the contract six months before their contract ends. So I think... Uh, the, the, the things are always on top of it. And we also monitor our competitor uh, movement and things like that. So, and we have been doing this for, for the last eight, nine years already. So, um, you know, we, we, we're very aware of what our competitors are doing and what our plan to, uh, you know, to, 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 to uh, uh, make sure that, you know, um, you know, we'll, we'll, our, our business uh, stay safe. Yeah. So thank you. Thanks, Alex. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Melia. Let me just jump in quickly on this. I think there was uh, another similar question along the likes of um, technology moat. Um, well, so so if if you look at the product, it's a our product. It's it's a it's it's an app, right? So it's natural to think that uh, the moat is built around the technology. Of course, technology wise, I think JS uh, very uh, incisely talked about our uh, virtual live technology, which is cutting edge. Uh, there is not a single application out there today that allows you to basically do hand gesture, uh, motion gesture on your on your face, live streaming 
without an extra tool. You always need an extra tool, but this on our application, this is the first. So this is actually cutting edge. It, it looks very natural, but it's cutting edge. But beyond that, I, I think this is a very, Alex, Alex, uh, as Alex mentioned, 87,000 contracted streamers. It sounds like a five digit number, but if you just put that into perspective, 1,000 people in one ballroom, you have 87 ballrooms filled with uh, influencers with more than 10,000 fans each. Uh, in in one of the largest uh, uh, markets uh, globally, these contracted streamers are contracted our platform exclusively, minimum of one year, upwards upwards to seven years. We have a full in house team that helps manage uh, this uh, these contracted streamers. Uh, this is a very this is a mode that is not penetrable, and uh, that is the reason why we've been able to basically grow leaps and bounds uh, across uh, the last uh, last five six years, and the profitability has just been. Uh, uh, growing uh, since uh, since we started focusing on basically growing our business in, in Northeast Asia. So this mode is not penetrable. It's it's very 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 tight. Um, so to 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 give you a good sense of uh, where the the competitive edge lies, it's in this content in these contracts, the eighty seven thousand contracts that basically are exclusive. These streamers cannot move to another platform to stream while they are still in contract with us. Thanks, Joseph. All right, let's move on to the next question. Questions on financials. Uh, why is the financials of One Seven Life still mediocre since the failed M17 IPO days in 2018? Does it imply it will be challenging for a company to turn profitable um, and also share price after the IPO? I guess this question is asking about that. And so I cannot comment on share price, unfortunately, but... um. Uh, I think mediocre is a is a very uh, relative word. So if you look at the circular where we where we where we shared um, of our full year full year numbers last year and also the first half numbers this year, we generated I think again uh, you should double check this uh, fifteen to sixteen million dollars of uh, positive uh, adjusted EBITDA, and um, again uh, in 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 this this market in this market condition generating within half a year, 15 to $16 million of uh, EBITDA. Uh, I, I, I would say that is a pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, performance compared to where we were, I think six years, uh, six years ago. So uh, that, that is one. I, I, and um, I've been reading the news uh, recently about most of the, most of the quarterly earnings of a lot of, uh, a lot of our competitors and other, other players in the market. I do not know of a, I have not come across uh, a similar result as as uh, uh, the, the seller result we put forward. In addition, if you look at the basically look at the trend of our historical performance, it, we've just grown leaps and bounds. Basically, in the first half, this if you compare what we've done in the first half of this year compared with what we did what we did last year, uh, you can actually just see in terms of the relative uh, performance of how we've done. So I would I would think that uh, mediocre wouldn't be the right word to use here. Again, it's relative. Uh, comparing with our size plus uh, the, the region that we're in, I think that this is actually quite a very strong uh, uh, performing company. Now, this is, of course, off the back of uh, VTech. VTech has done their work. They've gone through, I think, all, all the different uh, possible targets um, uh, uh, that they could that could work with, with them. And as uh, JS and, and, um, and Alex and, and Kenny mentioned earlier, this inflection point that we're facing right now is the virtual liver uh, virtual liver growth right? This is a huge market in Japan. If you look at the likes of um, uh, the listed companies in in Japan that are doing just sub performance of what we are doing, yet the market is valuing them at the the, the price that they're valuing. You see the size of this market. So not only have we done really well, right? In in the last four to five years, uh, I think the the growth trajectory is actually very clear. If you if you look at the the the, the studies again, this is of course not an indication of of what um, what the share price will be, it's uh, unfortunately we we cannot control or comment on this. Uh, but I, I think uh, just to clarify, I don't think it's mediocre by any 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 measure. Thanks, Joseph. Actually, there's a similar question uh, talking about financials. Maybe we can sort of just jump into that, and since a related topic, financials for FY twenty to FY twenty two um, seem to suggest uh, there's a drop of forty percent versus FY twenty two. Um, I guess the question is, so want to know sort of why is this so? And the projected financials seem to suggest a jump. I can take it, and then Kenny, you can jump in later. 
Yeah. Um, uh, so I assume you're talking about revenue. I think I assume you're talking about revenue because every other metric is growing. So revenue is coming down. Obviously, we went through COVID. Uh, this is not uh, particular to our business. I think every business uh, that is uh, with uh, in in the in the business of basically home economy, right? In in that sense, uh, experience a bump in a in a in a drop. So I think that is uh, uh, reasonable and understandable. However, if you look at how we've actually improved on all our margins, right? So I think that is quite clear how uh, we've been able to adapt uh, despite uh, the, the weakening in, in uh, macro demand of, of, of home economy product. But uh, I'd like to point you to one very specific metric that I would always look at, essentially EBITDA, or if you wish, adjusted EBITDA. Right? Because we have a lot of uh, different financial instruments for evaluation that would affect the bottom PL. But if you look at the, just the operating profit, if you just look at the EBITDA or the opera, uh, adjusted EBITDA, you get a sense of how well we're doing. And it's not possible for us to do so well if the, the, the business is not strengthening over time. Again, Kenny, you can jump in to, to, to add anything if, if you have. Sure. Um, as Joe just mentioned, uh, there was a macroeconomic changes, the COVID pandemic and the resumption of the old activities. So there were some fluctuations in revenue, that, that is true. But our focus is the profitability. Our strategy focus on the, how much we can uh, get the high profitability utilizing our infrastructure and also the, uh, the use good talent uh, in your platform and also the good quality content. That is our focus. And uh, we achieved the positive EBITDA uh, for the last three, more than three years, and uh, margin is improving. So uh, I believe our financial is very healthy and strong. Thanks, Kenny. Thanks, Joseph. Okay, let's move on to the third, uh, the other question I'm seeing over here in terms of the votes. Um, they're talking about some of the peers with competitors like Huya Inc. Um, and also Twitch Interactive uh, after the acquisition by Amazon um, and also sort of asking management you know, in terms of your views for this space. I can jump in and then of course, Jess, if, if you have, uh, you, can, you can comment on this. All right, so again, these are very different products in very different markets. I'll talk you through them. Again, this does not represent... Uh, this only represents my view, not not market view. Uh, so so take it with a pinch of salt. We are operates primarily in in China, a highly explosive and competitive market where they have to pay out usually ninety cents on a dollar or like a, even a dollar ten on the dollar for every dollar that they receive, they're losing ten cents or they only make ten cents as gross margins. Right. So if, if you look at Huyato, these platforms basically have very, very low gross margins in this market where, where basically they burnt through their cash uh, just to gain market share and ended up becoming a race to the bottom. And, and so they don't have the competitive mode where we do. Now, the platforms in China, they are uh, signed to, uh, to agencies, as Alex mentioned. Agencies work with them. They have all the bargaining power. And, and so basically platforms like we are and we have close to no, no bargaining power. And so from margin perspective, it's very, very little. Whereas uh, for 17 Life, it's very different. We have all the bargaining power because we control and we work directly with the content creators. We have a full stack of, uh, uh, of uh, agency uh, personnel that are working with the content creators directly. We do not use our external agencies. So our margins are very, very strong. If you look at the growing margins for, for Japan, our, our largest market, it's, it's quite clear. Now, Twitch, if you are familiar with the Twitch uh, uh, ecosystem, you know that four years ago, uh, they also paid out 90, 90 cents on the dollar. And then they realized that this is not sustainable. And then it went down to 50 cents on the dollar. And right now they're lowering themselves to 45 cents on the dollar because they're learning from us. They realized that it was not uh, sustainable. They realized that this market is not sustainable if you are paying out this uh, this type of economy. Now, uh, we are the one of the few live streaming platforms that basically have created this moat around our, our content, around our ability to basically monetize for our, uh, our content creators and at the same time, be able to make a, a healthy margin for ourselves. Now, Twitch has basically reduced their, their, their margin payout to their content creators from 90 cents to like 45 cents and 50 cents. But if you look at uh, their stack, right? So while they are owned by Amazon, their stack is actually one of the most over-engineered over, over, over -engineered stacks out there. So from a cost basis, 
their 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 engineering costs are not are not attractive at all. Whereas if you look at our margins, our margins are very attractive even for for uh, on a content basis because our engineers we have over. Again, I'm not sure if this is public information, but we have a significant size of our team that is uh, that is uh, that are actually engineers. We we actually have one of the stronger tech strongest tech teams in uh, in Japan and Taiwan today. So I think these are all competitive modes that we've done really well for the last 10 years building out this business compared to these platforms that you talk about. Again, very different platforms in very different markets in very different dynamics uh, than, than, than us. Thank you. Maybe let's move on to the live streamer v live portion. There are two questions here. I think we can sort of combine them, right? How many streamers v livers have you contracted in Southeast Asia? Um, are you actively recruiting talents? How's the demand like for these creators? And also, I guess the second question is which related to it, revenue share uh, with the V-Livers and streamers also. Uh, question over here. So I think I can I can take that. So um, so our, our revenue share is uh, pretty straightforward. Um, so uh, both in Japan, a little bit different, but uh, uh, so Japan is about 35% to uh, to share with the, the streamer. So um in terms of uh, Southeast Asia, um, you know, uh, with the DISPAC, we are looking into uh, grow the Southeast Asia a little bit further. Uh, in terms of the VLiver, we are uh, currently focusing Japan content right now because uh, this word uh, uh, VLiver is booming right now. So I think uh, the focus should be focusing in the content in Japan. And once the content is ready, we can export it to uh, Southeast Asia and also possibly in the US in the future. Um, and on top of that, uh, with the IP that we're currently working on, it is also be launching uh, end of the Q4 and big, uh, next year. So um, I think uh, in terms of the growth, we have seen a, a, a double the digital growth on our platform. So, you know, with the indication of the data, we are very excited about this uh, portion of the business. And okay, next question. How does one seven nine differentiate from other social media and e-commerce streaming platforms? Similar to another question that I've, I saw, um, is TikTok considered a competitor business? I think uh, is uh, uh well let's talk about uh, what's the difference, right? I think the uh, uh, the core business model is different. All right. So um, for One Seven Life is, um, you know, we are uh, selling virtual point. The user purchased the virtual point to support the favorite live streamer with gifting and uh, fan club subscription. So it's very different, right? So uh, TikTok is in the traffic and they sell ads. So, so it's a completely different business. We'll talk about it. And uh, our, our, our way to monetize is very straightforward, uh, you know, and, and also uh, very clear for, for the content uh, creator, like what Joe say, it will help them to pursue their dream, right? And with, with the monetization power they have, they can help to continue to create the content they would like to create and also pursue their dream in the longer term. So I think uh, it's um, very, very different. Yeah. Okay. And earlier on, we talked about some of the offline events, right? There's a question over here, which is what's the revenue model for these offline events and do users actually have to buy tickets to attend them? Uh, so I think basically the offline event you don't, you, you don't need to, uh, you don't need to buy the ticket to attend. And also, uh, our offline events um, uh, for the ROI is 150 percent. So basically, um, with the with the monetization uh, in you know the, the gifting, you know we 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 making sure that you know uh, we uh, we make profit out of it. So you don't have to purchase ticket to to attend the event. We have various different events. So the one that you sh you saw on the video, uh, those were the fans. Uh, you know they they basically uh, uh, you know uh, participate in the uh, competition of the event, supporting their favorite uh, streamer. So um, so they're eligible to join the, the the offline event. So in terms of markets that you guys are operating in, are there any other markets that you need to enter besides the current ones that you are in? Uh, so like I previously mentioned that, uh, you know, with the, the dispatch, uh, we'll be able to have a launch pad uh, deeper into Southeast Asia. So that will be focusing on it. And also with the VLive content that we'll be creating, you know, we're looking at the U.S. market. So. Another question would be on the content on the platform. How does One Seven Life monitor the content that's published? Are you ensure that the content is safe? Yeah, I can take that. So uh, we have about uh, four layers of protection there. So 
The first one being we distribute our content through uh, partner content delivery networks or CDNs. So um, CDNs um, provide a level of uh, filtering. Um, th so that's one. Um, after that, the second layer, uh, we have our own machine learning algorithms that um, in real time detect any problematic content or inappropriate content and automatically brings that down uh, and, and stops it from being published. So that's the second level. Uh, third level, we have a 24-7 uh, team that looks at 100% of our live streams. Of course, they take samples of each. Uh, they monitor 100% of our live streams and sees whenever we see a uh, poor content, we take it out. And then the fourth layer is uh, operational. So uh, the majority of our streamers are contracted with us. And through the contracting process, um, we do uh, KYCs on these uh, streamers, right? So it's not like other platforms where anybody can stream, right? For us, it's contracted people who we have chosen uh, that that stream. So all these four layers add together, we've had a flawless safety record since uh, 2015. So uh, it's been working quite well for us. Okay, maybe let's move on to some of the other questions. Uh, Hong Hui, probably you might be able to help with some of these uh, more technical ones with regards to the transaction, right? Mm. Um, if I redeem, how much will I get back? Yeah, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, so currently what we have indicated uh, in the circular, this is based on our best estimate, uh, the range of the price per share, per share price redemption price is between $5, exactly $5 to $5 and 2 cents. So 5.00 to 5.02. So how we arrive at this number is because, uh, you know, currently uh, the, the cash that's sitting on the escrow account you accumulate certain kind of daily uh, interest and interest rate fluctuates. So to the best we can, uh, we estimate uh, what's the potential uh, the range that we could have because the date of the calculation of the redemption price is supposed to be two days before the completion as per our uh, IPO prospectus. Uh, so that's the range that we could get. Yeah, so let's say if you have 1,000 shares, uh, you redeem 100% means all 1,000 shares redeem, you'll get somewhere between 5,000 to 5,020. Yeah, so that's just give you a sense. And a related question would be, can one do partial redemption? Yes, you can. Yeah, just indicate the amount of uh, shares that you want to redeem in the redemption form and mail it back and uh, and uh, ensure that the mail will reach by uh, 28. Yeah. Similar, related in a way, how was the valuation of 1.7 Life arrived? Uh, so there's uh of, of okay of first of all uh, there's uh some benchmarking that we do when we are doing our DD for sure you know against the compar uh, all the comparables, uh and of course this also as a result of the negotiation so it's a combination of multiple factors, but for reference you can take a look at the independent valuation report that is uh published by FNS China so that's actually included in our circular as one of appendixes. So you will see how they are valuating 100% uh, of this one seven life business and using different uh, valuation method, uh, including comparable method, also including DCF method. So you can take a look at that to have another view. Yeah, from our perspective, we use benchmark uh, ourselves and we is done through a negotiation. Yeah. Okay, a similar one uh, relating to that, right, uh, would be... Uh, can management please share in more detail what are the plans to use the DSPEC proceeds, assuming the deal goes through? Uh, maybe I will defer discussion to either Alex or Kenny. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think uh, um, so the few things right that um, we um, you know continue to uh, develop uh, enhance our product. So investment over on the product development side, and also um, um, you know uh, constantly uh, looking to the um, uh, the right company we can uh, uh, do acquisition with uh, to speed up the uh, to to speed up the content process, and uh, other th other than that, just uh, uh, you know ensure that we have enough cash uh, for the company. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, in addition to that, of course, we are uh, we are aiming for the expansion uh, from the the geography perspective, including the uh, SEA uh, Southeast Asia and the US, and of course, uh, we are investing a lot into the B Liber uh, technologies. Thanks, Kenny. 
Can you share a little bit more? Next question, right? Can you please share a little bit more about the metrics that shareholders can track, right? Who are the platforms that... I missed this question, so sorry. Who are the platforms that we can benchmark against using these metrics? I'll take this. As, as mentioned earlier, I think the, the key metric to track against is uh, EBITDA or just that EBITDA. Um, and you can bench that against our operating profit, right? So if you prefer profit versus EBITDA, because our DA is, is quite limited. Um, so essentially, I, I would say it's quite similar. But again, so just these few metrics, EBITDA, adjusted EBITDA, operating profit, whichever you prefer. Uh, generally, we look at EBITDA or you know, just the EBITDA as a, as a key metric uh, because that is directly related to our business, not related to any accounting principles or whatnot. Right? In terms of the platforms that uh, you, you can or should benchmark against, it, it's difficult for me to tell you who to look at uh, because, uh, yeah, but if, if you look at the, the different, uh, the different uh, uh, businesses that we talked about earlier that are also in the same markets in, in Japan, these are listed companies. But it's it's quite easy to 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 just Google them. You would see like two or three companies that are listed in Japan within the same within the same space as us, uh, with very similar metrics, uh, doing very well. Um, I I, I would consider them as a as a relative comp, given that we're in the same market, in the same business, and in an area that we're looking to grow into. I think that 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 would be a good good way. Again, please do your own research on on this. We're unable to comment on how you should bench uh your your analysis against uh, which comps. Yeah, just to add on a bit on this, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's an independent valuation report that's uh, being published and a summary of that is part of the circular in appendix. So you may refer to that as because they did quote a few uh, benchmarks on the EBITDA multiples. So you can look at them to, to, you know, to make your assessment as well. Moving on to the next question. Um, what is quality content? How do you measure this and also ensure monetization of these quality content? Can take that one. So, um, so I think the good quality of the content is that can attract user to repeatedly watch. And also, you know, that's what we do. Our, our mission is emotional connection. So, uh, you know, they, this makes a very different uh, from us to uh, other uh, social media platform. Yeah, I extend this a bit. So, uh, we have a definition of quality uh, users uh, within the the circular. It is essentially a user that has found a liver and watched it for three hundred and twenty times, which was three hundred twenty because it's about a year. So, for us, quality content means content that can attract um fans who can follow them for about a year, right? Uh, so that's how we measure it. And then in terms of the monetization, I think we disclosed the. Uh, ARPU or uh, this uh, quality content essentially our ARPU is the highest in the uh, the market uh, right now so um, we, because of the combination of the offline events and the interactive features uh, that we have so we've had pretty good monetization here and it all of course leads to what Joe always points to our bottom line our adjusted EBITDA that's what makes us profitable thank you uh, okay, there's an, another similar sort of question related to this, right? How would you compete with some of the major live streaming platforms, uh, TikTok, Twitch, now, and they've also called the only fans here? What's your pull factor to draw viewership from these? Well, like what uh, Joe previously mentioned, right? So the difference, uh, um, the contract the streamer, you know, they, they can only stream on 17 Live, right? So uh, other than other,
I, there's no one platform that achieves this type of margins. That's why I think when we talk about the relative performance of this company, it is incredible to be honest. I I've been in this industry for so long, and I I know what we what we what we're able to produce, and you're only able to produce the margins that we we do simply because we control the full vertical. So. To say that we 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 compete is is not really a fair way of putting it. We don't have to compete because we are right up there. So if you look at any of the Japanese platforms, you should go to, go to Japan. I just ask anybody about anybody about Ichinana. Like if you go to Tokyo, go to go skiing this year or whatnot, right? Just go ask anybody about Ichinana. They will tell you this is the by defect uh, default the number one live streaming platform in Japan. Uh, you, you do not feel it in Singapore. But uh, as a Singapore founder, having having built this together with the team, this is not something that has been easy. It's taken us quite some time. Thanks, Joseph. It's 8.30 now. Maybe do we have time for one more question? Just one. Uh, I see that's about almost 30 questions that have gone through already. Um, just a last question. Maybe if management can also talk a little bit about their initiatives, strategic initiatives going forward. Because it's one question that's asking... How are decisions on strategic initiatives made, given this is a founder company? Any reason why your previous group CEO who grew the Japan market left late last year? Um, well, so I, I guess the, the four of us, right, we're key management, right? So we, we basically work together every quarter to discuss initiatives. We have our annual plans. We have our quarterly initiatives that we, we, where we push forward. So we, we, we lead it as a, as a team and we get feedback from the ground and basically uh, the, the initiatives are, are, are consensus driven. Um, a hero has been with us uh, for, for the longest time, right? So for personal reasons, he left us. I don't think this is something that uh, is is uh is uh, is unusual in fact i think uh, they are still uh his his uh, venture capital firm is still one of the uh, large shareholders of of uh, our company and so i think this is uh, quite quite understandable given how long he's been with the company thanks joseph all right we've reached the end of this session today it's 8 32 now um, thank you everybody for joining us this evening and thank you so much management teams from VTech and also 17 Live. Very insightful. I really appreciate the color and going through all the questions tonight. Uh, for those that's joined us today, thanks for joining us again. The replay will be available on Facebook and also on YouTube and we look forward to having you at the next at Kevin Webinars. Thank you and have a good evening ahead. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Bye.